All right, so this is the pre-class video for class number seven, um, which is on political virtues. So the virtue of an educated voter and also um, Aristotelian manager or leader, leadership and Aristotle's virtues. So, <clears throat> so Aristotle had a list of virtues and some of them were personal, social, political. And last class was focused mostly on personal issues. And now we're gonna focus on political issues. Um, all right, so what have I got? Let's look at the virtues here. Just a reminder, um, temperance, self-control, um, <clears throat> so, um, courage, um, okay. Another thing I want to point out is that, you know, we covered these four articles in one class time, but each of those people are describing this huge change in their way of life and their way of thinking. And so I do want you to think about that, right? Because when they were in college, they were in one kind of mindset. And then looking back, they realized that was incomplete and they changed. So <clears throat> for example, the other thing to look, to think about is the way they were conditioned as children and how they transitioned to something different. Um, that's the whole Greek thing about going from an unexamined to an examined life. And college is about that. Uh, the next thing I will say is that I would never ever tell you how to think because my life, my thinking and my living has changed so radically over the years. So why would I have any interest in trying to control my students' thoughts? But I do think they need to think about their thoughts and to think about what might be missing and to think about how they might be blind to something or they might be a lot more obsessive than they should than they should be or than they really would want to be over time. Just a lot of things like that. So um, Newland was raised in a strict Orthodox situation and he became obsessional and then he became an atheist and then he decided, oh, actually religion is about spiritual life it's not inconsistent with the life of the spirit, with wanting to live for the sake of something greater than yourself. So <clears throat> all of these virtues are part of that flourishing life, and they do require getting beyond obsessional thinking because they're all about balancing emotion and thought and action um, and constantly examining and re-examining. So, Aristotle's model is biological and it's spiritual at the same time, just like Mr. Newland. Then the one on revenge was about research, again, about we have two tendencies. We can seek revenge um, as a way to survive, a trigger of a survival instinct. And it's natural if you feel really threatened. But of course, you can overreact or you can think something's threatening when it's not. And so that's the courage uh, virtue, is that what, what should you fear and how much should you fear it? And also um, uh, sociability or anger, right? Anger is another virtue that if you overreact, overreacting is uh, taking revenge. It's one kind of overreaction to situations where fear is legit and anger is legit. Um, <clears throat> and then forgiveness is Aristotle's thing is much more oriented toward we are social and political by nature. 
the good state person weaves people together, sets up laws where they people get rewarded for working together and cooperating and supporting each other. So that's the generosity. Uh, generosity, the Greek word or the original translation was liberalism. So this is this is traditional liberal arts education. Um, and liberal meant being generous, especially with your money, actually. It wasn't just your time. You have to give away money in order to be rational because you have to acknowledge your interdependence with other people and you have to develop trust of other people and goodwill. You have to show people you have goodwill for them. You want them to flourish. <clears throat> um, so that would be a way to promote cooperation rather than revenge. Uh, the third article was about depression and that's um, certainly an extreme. And um, this level of biological dysfunction, um, again, it's about relationships. If you remember, you feel very isolated from other people. You can't respond to other people. And is there anything in our society that uh, tends to feed into these mental illnesses? Um, is the reason why we score really high on research, you know, the percentage of Americans that, I don't know, take shootings um, and depression and stress is simply because we have the research and it happens in other countries. They just don't have researchers to document this. Um, but I do think if you're a sophisticated country and you have access to, to research, that you ought to always be asking, are we structured in a way that moves toward cooperation and balance and mental health? Because our social life affects our inner life, our mental health. Um, rational ambition, do we provide opportunities for people to develop? Otherwise they're gonna get depressed or stressed um, or why they wanna take revenge if they didn't have access to um, a good education or a good job. What about pride? Um, are there people that go over and above and create a higher quality of life? Do we honor them? Do we honor the people who do that? Or do we honor people for getting rich or being physically beautiful? Or um, And athletic prowess is a good thing, but do we over honor it compared to other, other um, talents? What about a good teacher? Do teachers get honored as much? I'm thinking K through 12, frankly. Um, do they get honored as much as athletes or movie stars? Should they? Um, humor, that's important. Um, but let's see. <clears throat> Depression, stress, okay. Sociability affects our ability to be stressed, to reduce stress. So you think about uh, the way that social culture can increase stress or reduce stress. Um, so there is this connection between the social, the political, and the personal. But here are specifically the political virtues. So the economic sector is the economy designed to weave together the rich and the poor and create a cooperative cooperation moving toward maintaining a strong and stable middle class. Um, are the legislators good at making laws that um, bring people together and promote flourishing? Um, in the distribution of wealth, do the legislators know how to allocate resources, make laws that redistribute wealth, in, again, in a way that benefits everyone? And in the punishment, do the legislators make laws that punish people justly, that focus on rehabilitation, that treat people as having equal opportunity for a, a lawyer? Um, and do people get equal treatment in the law courts? 
knowing how to apply the laws. Okay, so our jury members are Americans trained to be able to look at the facts and draw conclusions rather than appeals to emotions. You know that Athens got corrupted by this. Are Americans corrupted by this? How do people behave on juries? I actually was um, subpoenaed three times to be on a jury. And <clears throat> one time it was a woman who had forged a check and the defense attorney picked me because he thought I would identify with the woman. I mean, you could tell that the prosecuting attorney picked uh, uh, older white guys and the defense attorney picked younger women, <laughs> just on the assumption that nobody could be objective. Uh, unfortunately, when we got into the jury room and we deliberated, that was sort of how it held out. The, the guys said, well, obviously she's guilty. I mean, no problem. And there was one woman who said, now, wait a second, I don't think so, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, that was, Ah, it was an educational experience. And I, when hopefully you will get subpoenaed to be in a jury and it will mess up with your life, but I do think it's a really good educational experience. I had another one, it was a civil case. And then um, I had another one and yeah, long story, but really learning how to be a good juror and then applying that same quality in the other aspects of your life. It really is a beautiful system. If people would just recognize what they need to do to keep that system going and to honor that system that they happen to be born into. I just, it takes my breath away both to think about how Athens had that incredible society and also to think about I was born into a society where, where I could be picked on a jury, and it's amazing. So it's such a small percentage of human beings who have ever lived have had that opportunity. And we should work on thinking clearly about legal issues, even I mean, not when we're on juries, but when we're reading the paper or something. So we get used to it. We learn how to deliberate. And we also talk to our friends or other people and really try to cultivate citizen consciousness. It is not easy. And again, when I look at the toxic environment in the media and the way public affairs are covered, it's just, oh, it, it really is horrible. Um, <clears throat> I don't wanna go through all of this stuff. Um, it's practical wisdom is knowing how to deliberate, knowing how to be presented with an event, get the facts, figure out um, which facts are important, figure out what the next choice is, what the options are that will always promote flourishing. So that's, that's the key. There always is a, um, an end point. <clears throat> but it's very imprecise um, and people disagree, but that's all right. That's how you learn to be um, an educated voter. So here is the, um, that's the reading of the virtue of an educated voter. Um, here's the outline. Um, I really, I mean, you do need to read this. This is a very good article, I think and very relevant, uh, it seems to me. Everyone agrees that to maintain a republic, we need a society governed by citizens and a broad-based education, but people disagree on who pays for it. So again, analogous to Athens, they didn't have money, right? People just had to attend tragedies and they had to listen to recitations of Homer, but there were lots and lots of public events where the poets were trying to educate them in learning how to think like a citizen. But in America, like we need a system of public education. How are we gonna pay for it? And the philosophy or, uh, originally 
and the, you know, based on our Greek tradition, is that education is a social benefit and it's collective and we all benefit from that. But the other philosophy that has risen more recently, it's an individual achievement. And if you, if parents achieve, they can afford to give their kid a better education and then the kid achieves and they can afford to give their kid. Whereas if you don't, if you are poor, <coughs> You either squandered your money or you're lazy and you didn't get a good enough job. That's kind of the assumption. Um, and so there's less funding for public education or any kind of education, and it's more expensive. The cost goes up, the funding goes down. Um, and I think that's not a good thing. <laughs> so even at the founding, what were the threats to the American Republic. Well, those monarchies and aristocracies in Europe wanted us to fail. Ha, you gotta think about this, right? Um, and within the US, we were internally divided. So we needed to have a strong national identity. We needed to be able to think of ourselves as Americans, as opposed to Europe. I don't know, I think this is interesting when you think about how you want to, your mindset, and what you want to teach your kids, the kind of mindset. Um, the voters were not well educated. And so our founders are very worried because in Europe, there were all these demagogues um, who would appeal to class resentments and promote the violent redistribution of wealth. Um, or they were worried that a military, power hungry military leader would take over. Um, and they knew that the regimes they left thrive on an un uneducated populace. They accept blind obedience and blind loyalty. And they don't, they've also read the Greek, so they know all that stuff too. <coughs> um, so then Mr. Taylor talks about the necessity for virtue, and he doesn't mentioned that this is Aristotle, but it's just obvious that it is. The capacity to transcend their diverse self-interests by favoring the common good of the political community. All right, well, it's not true because Aristotle said it. It's just that it's odd that he wouldn't sort of know that um, that was a major foundational text that the educated elite were sort of aware of. Now you will see that our, our uh, founders really liked Confucius Analects more. They wanted that to be taught much more broadly than Aristotle because Aristotle is too esoteric. It's too complicated. Um, and the Analects gives you the basic virtues. So if everybody pursued private interest, it would succumb to um, demagogues and tyrants. So in order to override that, people needed to be taught the value of virtue. They needed education um, to distinguish between worthy candidates for office and the bad ones. Um, uh, isn't that what Socrates was trying to do? Of course. So Benjamin Rush um, said that to keep a society stable, the educational system has to support the constitutional system. And in a democracy, the citizens have to be educated to be self-controlled and generous and have the virtues so they can take turns ruling and being ruled. This is what freedom really means, not freedom to live as you like. And Rush was aware we've changed our form of government, but we need to have a revolution in the way we think and the way we live. Um, but education is expensive, so who pays? Well, the privileged people just wanted to hire tutors and prepare their sons, right? And they didn't want to pay taxes. Jefferson wanted to tax the rich so that the poor could get an education, so that um, the position you hold is based on merit, not on who your daddy is. Uh, the old artificial aristocracy 
should be replaced with a natural aristocracy. So somebody who's naturally better at practical wisdom, which is very difficult, should be given that position. So it is a difficult skill or talent. But on the other hand, just because you're poor doesn't mean you don't have it. So you need to give people in the lower classes an opportunity to develop their talents. And if they start showing talent for leadership, ruling for, for the sake of the ruled, they should definitely be given those positions. Um, of course, there were no girls and um, no African-Americans. And they even said, you don't want to educate them because then they'll be rebellious. <laughs> they won't do your work for you. <laughs> that's, that's an old trope. We're going to read something else on that too. Um, now, this is funny that, that this Mr. Work was complaining that in Virginia, um, there's only one object to get rich, which of course is exactly what Aristotle said is the worst political evil. Um, and this has always been a problem. So I think that's funny. Um, state legislators don't want to vote to raise taxes because they wouldn't get reelected. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> so they left it to the counties. Well, the counties then um, were, I mean, definitely this is where African Americans, women would not get much of a chance. Um, all right, so the founders, the leaders of our nation at the beginning, they knew that long-term and uneducated populace, populace is going to threaten the democracy. Um, but the people weren't convinced that education was worth the cost. They preferred consumer goods. Um, and also some of the education was Greek and Latin. So it was this model of liberal arts that you're getting some kind of modified view of. But that would seem really crazy. Like we have so much else to do. Why are we teaching Greek and Latin? Which I, I agree with that. Like you can read Plato and Aristotle in English. I don't think it'll kill you. Um, what about the North and the South? And this is really important. Um, the New York started a public education system way before the South did, 1790s. And then it, the systems grew, except in they did, it didn't in the South. Um, the Northerners expected that there would be economic benefits from educating the people. And then in the 1900, 1980, there was a huge leap forward in the percentage of citizens who were college graduates until 1970s. And um, then it started to go south. <laughs> um, the philosophy changed from a social and political good to an economic good. The goal isn't political virtue, it's economic growth. So you don't have to think like a citizen. Advertising. Success is defined by wealth. So now your education is, is driven by self-interest instead of the civic virtue. Um, today, the student debt has increased. Um, you know, there's more, school costs more. And so you keep feeding in to people being money motivated rather than motivated for civic virtue if you keep charging more for the education. Um, so the motive is not knowledge for its own sake or happiness, appreciation of art, but rather it's just technical skills. Um, but there are social benefits from this um, and also just educate people for rational inquiry so that they can uh, be good jurors and good voters. Um, recently, the government has been demonized as anti-democratic because the public schools brainwash um, and they're immoral and, and they're claimed to be anti-democratic. I think that's funny because I don't get to decide what my kid reads. So it's tyranny. It's like, wait a second. So if you leave people on their own, that's democracy and 
what that happens is that if if you just let people decide for themselves, their kids don't get educated, and then they're much more vulnerable to an authoritarian leader. So I do think public education is a way to prevent an authoritarian leader, but that's not the way the rhetoric works. Um, and our founders also thought that. Um, the funding has been reduced most in the poor neighborhoods because it's based on um, real estate tax. Um, so we have this um, setup that's based on competition and adversity. And when I was talking about the revenge um, article where he said, you know, we have, uh, we're, we're uh, wired both for competition and adversity as well as for cooperation. So the educational system really should be at the cornerstone of cooperation because then you, you know, then you can get along, you can find common ground. Um, I think it's ironic, of course, that the polarization is occurring in a, in a society where people are technically educated. Um, and there's plenty of college educated people who are leaders in the polarization. Some of our most polarizing politicians graduated from some of the most prestigious colleges and law schools, whatever. So, you know, you can use your intelligence uh, for whatever goals you want. And so that that's a problem, but citizens should be informed. Um, okay, is public education anti-democratic? What do you think? Uh, since the recession, funding for schools has been cut. There's more Medicare more jails and prisons, students have to pay more, tuition has gone up, government funds have gone down. Um, lower income students have to work so they can't get the best grades, right? Um, the future social costs. This is the argument that we're gonna lose a middle class in the future, like the things we do now matter. Um, and research shows that broader education pays off uh, in lots of ways. Politicians claim here's to honor the founders and then they push for the privatization of education, but that is not true, right? Historically, that's not true. People, the founders did think education was a social good. Um, <clears throat> what are our common beliefs? And he says, that we used to have common beliefs, but um, we don't have them anymore. And that really annoys me because again, the classical virtues that I teach are common beliefs. So where's your head at, you know? We also, um, <clears throat> so he says it's a problem. The sole common good is a celebration. Okay, so now we just have different strokes for different folks. And we need to revive the founder's definition of education as a public good. We should recover their concept of virtue. Well, you know, that's not so hard. You can do that. Um, <clears throat> so, well, but, but here's another thing. And, and this is um, connecting this back to Aristotle's virtues, but the Southern states have always had a minimal government policy. And so they are once again, um, <clears throat> um, declining in their educational system. Um, they're also welfare states, they hate government and they vote for politicians that cut government, but they are the welfare states. So the blue states are basically paying for a lot of programs for people in the red states. Um, and that's, I don't think that's fair, right? It's undermining the stability of the blue states. But <clears throat> life goes on. Um, all right, so I'm, I do want you to read that and come with comments on that. Then I have an article on Aristotle and management. So this is um, the goal of life flourishing um, 
the virtues in the context of the business world. Or I have students who write papers about their coaches or just about leadership in general and they apply Aristotle, so that's fine. Self-control, how would you apply that if you're running a business? <coughs> okay, and um, self-control, uh, don't appeal to sex and don't have a sexually charged climate in your, in your workplace. Um, courage, knowing how to act in situations involving fear. And <clears throat> when you're a leader, you do have to act, sometimes without knowing everything. Um, so leaders have to know when they don't know enough and they should hold back, and when they have to act. And sometimes, you know, and they make mistakes because in leadership positions, if you do something today versus in two weeks from now, sometimes it makes a huge difference. Um, and you can't just be acting on principle. You can't just have the definition of virtue. You can't just have goodwill. You actually have to be able to make these particular decisions all the time. Um, um, okay. Convince the employees. They also have to be able to speak persuasively to the employees. Some employees will always complain and some will never complain. And neither one of those is, is really virtuous. You, if employees make good judgments about what to complain about, then you end up having a better, a better culture. So you would have a better business culture if the employees had the sense that they are listened to when they carefully have something to say. Um, okay. <clears throat> Leaders who are honest will create trust and goodwill. Uh, people will work together. If you have a bad leader, the best employees will leave. The worst will stay, but they're lazy. They won't work any more than they have to. And they don't care about the company only care about themselves. So it pays off in the end to rule for the sake of the rules, to really want your employees to flourish. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, political leaders have to worry about national security, diplomacy and intelligence to prevent war, um, how to be even tempered, right? Don't get angry too soon. Uh, give employees an opportunity to express when they're angry about something. Um, give them some outlet um, and let the employees know that you're actually acknowledging their complaints and looking for solutions. Um, righteous indignation, yeah. Um, people get angry because they aren't treated appropriately. And that's important too. Sense of humor, know how to have fun. Friendship, okay, this is really important in a workplace. Create bonds between workers at every level of the organization. Some are based on inequality, uh, supervisor and uh, supervised, and then some are equality. As, be as societies become more complex, we, we need to have really complex social networks more than we used to. Um, there's, here's all the ways you can abuse that authority. The relation between the stockholders, the managers, the workers, and the customers. Um, you know, if a, if a manager just wants to give more money to the stockholders, just make profits, then everybody else can suffer. So um, it's a balancing act. Um, hire workers that are trustworthy. Older workers should be respected. Um, sociability, putting people at ease. Um, letting employees know you care about them. Um, ra rational pride. Employees take pride in their work. Um, leaders recognize employees and praise them. Um, 
appropriate ambition. They give employees an opportunity to move up or to move sideways to just keep developing their talents. Um, High-mindedness, don't be petty or mean-spirited. Keep everything in perspective. And self-knowledge, know what your weaknesses are. Get advisors who can help you out. Listen to advice from people who know your company well. Um, justice, okay? How do you um, set up good relationships with the employees under a common body of laws. So the company would have rules and regulations. They need to be applied fairly and enforced equally. Don't let the powerful get away with stuff because that creates bad blood in a company. Pay them appropriately, um, salaries and benefits. Pay your share of taxes. Don't constantly hire, pay millions of bucks to tax lawyers so you don't have to pay taxes. Taxes are important for social well-being, for education, for healthcare, for transportation, especially for the lower two thirds of the society that just won't get it unless it's publicly funded. Um, pay someone to work on legislation, find out which laws are, um, make recommendations to the legislatures that really, want to promote flourishing, not just your company's profit, immediate profit, right? Um, keep informed about what particular mix of private and public is the best. Um, don't overvalue the contribution of business. That every sector of society makes a contribution and they're all accountable for making the best contribution they can. Um, the universality of Aristotle's virtues. So I think, again, I'm arguing that they're universal. Um, we're making international laws, right? The United Nations. So we do keep having more and more institutions that reach more broadly, but we have international problems. <laughs> Our environmental problems are international. Money laundering problems are international. Um, shipping, um, trade, all this stuff is global. And so we need to have institutions and laws that actually apply globally. Um, so that's that article. And this is the article itself. And then the last thing here is, um, just a little article, a news article about being a change maker. So um, you can look at it, see what you think. I'm sorry that it's cut off at the beginning, but all right, whatever. Um, see what you think about um, you're in the midst of college is where you have to re-examine everything. Um, and you have to learn not to be afraid and not to be afraid of change because um, things are always changing and, are, and things are changing really fast. Now, our political system is still um, heavily dependent on old people and young people like you ought to get, get involved because uh, a lot of older people who vote are not voting in your interest. They're voting in their interest. And, and in, uh, they're following views that fit the society maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago, but just do not, they're not adaptive right now. So I would recommend that you don't let old people control the um, system. All right, so I had a student who wanted to get together in a reading group where you talk about political issues. And that came right the first semester of COVID or the, the fall of the first year of COVID. And so I decided, all right, I'm gonna take this time I have. And on the weekends, I am just gonna read. I'm gonna read books, uh, catch up on what's happened in my society since um, 
1980, because I knew things were happening and I knew the middle class was shrinking, but I never really took time to read a lot of books about it, really find out. So one thing I do is I try to read a book between Friday night and Sunday uh, supper time, just so it, all I'm thinking about is that one book, and then it will stick in my head a lot better because it's not just, you know, this and that. So it worked, right? And I do have outlines and I have scans of each of these documents, but I didn't put them on the site because I don't want anybody to think they're getting brainwashed or they're getting forced. Um, if you want any of these articles, um, I can send them to you, but I want to make sure that nobody feels uh, this is all your agency, what you want. Um, the Color of Law was an amazing book, and I can't believe I didn't know this, but it's the history of housing discrimination. My family's wealth depends a lot on home equity. <clears throat> Most middle-class people pay into their house. They have an amortized loan. And so they pay partly on the principal, partly on the interest. So they accumulate value in their home. That's wealth. They're accumulating wealth. Plus, white people live in neighborhoods where the value of the houses goes up. So they accumulate more wealth and then they can pass that down to their children or they can use it for healthcare in their old age. It really is awful. African-Americans have not had access to housing in neighborhoods that where the value of the houses go up and also where they have the amortized loan. So when you see ghettos or whatever, you really need to realize that that was based on racism. People were not, the real estate agents would, would fire anybody who sold a house to a black person. So they would get around the laws. Um, now, I don't wanna make you froth at the mouth or something, but I want, I just, what I think people have to do is you learn a whole lot of stuff in college. And then you decide, okay, there's only one thing I can dedicate my life to. I, there, I'm really limited in what I can do as an individual. But if everybody found the thing they think they can do best and then just do it and say, that's gonna be my contribution. Um, that's the best you can do but we're trying to save our democracy here. So, so it's the, it is one way to do it. Doesn't mean we will, but if we don't do that, we're definitely gonna lose it because we're too close to the brink here. Um, then I have an article on qualified immunity and this was related to the uh, George Floyd, the shootings and how police officers um, have qualified immunity. Another issue there is that when funding is cut for police or when the violence increases and people want more police, then um, the salaries go down or they don't go up. And so the police union makes deals with the city where, okay, we'll take less salary, but we're gonna have more qualified immunity. Like if one of our guys shoots someone, he's not going to be arrested. That's an exchange for a lower salary or no salary increase. And so that's, you know, happening around the country. Um, originalism is uh, this political philosophy that now the majority of the Supreme Court clearly has. And I mean, the decision made on the abortion, one, ex one part of it said, well, abortion is not mentioned in the constitution. <laughs> A lot of things are not, I mean, slavery, blah, 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 you know, women had no rights. Um, and actually, abortion was routinely practiced. It, and probably a lot of the founders didn't even know that it was because <laughs> they're out of it. 
But anyway, this is going to come back, the, the gutting of environmental protection laws. Yeah, we didn't have problems with clean water and clean air. Really? I mean, just because it's not in the Constitution, we're going to let our water and air get all messed up. We didn't need transportation. We didn't need, you know, there's lots of stuff that has changed since the, the founders. Um, so, but we have now five or six uh, justices that are originalists. They were picked, they were put into a group called the Federalists. And people who were originalists formed this Federalist group. And then a Republican president would pick from that group for their Supreme Court justice picks. Okay, so that's what we've got. And I do think it's worth reading something about which I did not do. I had not read about this before, what, 2021? So, you know, I forgive you, but it is interesting. Evil Genius is a, the story of the shrinking middle class since 1980. Very important, really, how it affects the culture. Twilight of Democracy, this woman um, used to be conservative. She's, she considered herself conservative and she, had a group, you know, a friend group, whatever, but she's describing how many of them have turned to authoritarianism and they join these very authoritarian governments in Hungary, um, I think Poland, um, Turkey, countries that used to be democratic are not. And one of her former friends is Laura Ingram. <laughs> and, you know, she's just shocked that um, people who had what she would consider conservative principles have really gone toward authoritarianism. This one is about um, how, to, how to change after the pandemic. We, we don't wanna go back to normal. We can't go back, we shouldn't wanna go back. I don't wanna write the kinds of philosophy books and journal articles that I used to write. And right now I'm just, I don't know what I wanna write because I'd really, it's more important to me to teach students things that I think might help them function in the post pandemic world. That's more important because, you know, I can retire. I don't have to function, but my students do. And so I'm hoping, at least you understand in my own mind that I tried to organize a class where the readings would be helpful to you. Um, but you know, you never know. And I, it's, you can have good intentions and make terrific mistakes. This one is a story of our torture program. So 350 pages, one weekend, that was a dark weekend. Um, but I'm glad I read it because I, I wanted to know what was going on. And this is a journalist. I mean, she really, has her data straight. She's got a lot of facts. They get uh, tedious, but there it is. I decided, all right, I'm going to do this. This is the story of Charles Koch, and he has a big political operation that basically runs Republican campaigns. Huge, like he will fund a city council um, candidate so that when that person gets the most money and wins, they will vote to change the zoning in that area because Mr. Koch wants to build a factory there and it's not zoned for factories. And he's, you know, it just goes all the way from, from uh, city councils to school boards, all the way up, you know, to the presidency and you name it. It's a very, very well-structured political machine. Um, and Mr. Koch made his money on fossil fuels and he really wants to gut environmental laws. He does because he did have to pay. He violated some of them and he had to pay and he was really mad. So he's taking revenge. Um, dark money is a good one that's this one is the story of Charles Koch, like starting with his childhood. His mother was never home. Um, these people are raised to be heartless billionaires, honestly. We have a lot of people raised uh, to just 
be heartless and get rich and richer. And they do what daddy wants them to do. They follow their conditioning. Um, so then the Cokes, this is later on as they develop this machine and the other families that are involved. Um, and then a Black woman's history of the United States. That was nice. And, and right when I was reading it, I, took, I checked the news and Kamala Harris was there. So uh, that was kind of interesting. It didn't even occur to me, you know, if I checked the news, I'll see in, uh, the latest Black woman who's made history, you know, or non-white woman. I mean, she's tech, I mean, it's just crazy. Um, she's not from... Uh, I don't think her background is, is, gosh, I can't remember. Anyway, it was a minority woman, I'll say, because I think just because you're not white doesn't mean you don't have a lot of different nuanced history in your background. Um, environmental issues. This will be the biggest issue for your lifetime. There's no question about it. And so article on the virtues of sustainability, linking Aristotle's virtues to sustainable life, a chapter on Aristotle and the United Nations model of education. The power of lift is Melinda Trump writes about her activity as a philanthropist, shows she supports women in developing nations. And then her husband or ex-husband, is really dedicated to um, avoiding climate disaster, getting down to zero carbon. And at this point he even wants to suck carbon out of the air. So he's sort of re-engineering the natural world out of desperation. So there's these two billionaires, the Koch brothers and the Gates team that are really duking it out for the future of the natural world. Then there's a book, Merchants of Doubt, and how there were just a very small number of people who um, sold doubt like a commercial product. So people bought into doubt about uh, the ozone hole, secondhand smoke, pesticides, climate change. So it's the same people and the same kind of sales. Um, the corruption of our political system, uh, who's taking it over? And then there's a book, The Imposters, how um, they don't have policies anymore. I was trying to find their policies because I like thinking about policy. And I hadn't, it hadn't crossed, you know, um, I hadn't read things. And finally I read this book and now I know why. <laughs> um, but that's, again, Republicanism can change. Um, Antitrust by Amy Klobuchar. This is about the growing monopolies and they're getting worse and worse. And um, she, she's her thing, she's a lawyer. So she wants to focus on uh, breaking down the monopolies and they're very powerful and they raise costs for everybody. So she's also my Senator in my state. Um, the best people, so this is about the people President Trump appointed to his cabinet. Now, my, the reason I vote, right, what motivates me to vote for one candidate as opposed to another is who they appoint to the cabinet. And I'm not sure, I don't know anybody else who explicitly says that, that's their reason. But my daughter worked for the Department of Labor and my son-in-law has worked there his, virtually his whole career. So I do know what these um, uh, institutions do, and I do think it's valuable. So the Department of Labor was minimum wage, right? I do think we should have a minimum wage. We disagree on what it is, but we definitely need one, or we're going to end up paying our people the same as the Chinese get paid, and I don't, I don't think anybody wants that. Then there's... Um, Occupational safety and hazards. Like you, there should be laws so that people don't have to work under really hazardous and unsafe conditions. And then there's um, whistleblower laws. If your company's breaking a law, 
you ought to be able to um, report it without losing your job or being demoted. And if you think that happened, you can sue and then the Department of Labor will support you. Um, and then the next thing is that the Congress passes laws, minimum wage law, whatever. And the function of these departments is to enforce it. Because if you have a law, but you don't enforce it, you might as well not have the law, right? Um, so this is, um, uh, yeah, I, I really, obviously I did not agree with the people that Trump put on the cabinet, but you know, you can disagree with me or you can think, well, I don't vote on the basis of that. I vote on the basis of other issues, which is fine. Um, and then you should think about, well, what issues do you vote on the basis of? Like, what are your priorities? And um, my priority is a middle class. And that's what the legislators have the power to do through their tax policies and their laws about minimum wage and safety hazard, right? I mean, all these things. That's basically what I think the Congress does. Um, housing and, and human services, um, all these different agencies um, are what enforce the laws that the Congress makes. And I do think they're all designed to improve the quality of life or to maintain the quality of life. Department of Education, Betsy DeVos, um, she went to, she's a billionaire who went to private Christian schools um, so I don't, you know, she doesn't have the best judgment about public educational system. Um, I don't think she does. And then I mentioned a few things that she did. Um, and the reason I think about that is my Scott, my son was the founder of a charter school. And so he's, he's affected by decisions that Betsy DeVos makes. Um, the hacking of the American mind. This is, um, this is a guy who went through all the chemistry behind our diet, right? The, the junk food that we eat that's motivated by profits, corn syrup. And um, he says we're addicted to sugar. Literally our bodies, serotonin and dopamine, we go like this. And so we are addicts. Um, I stopped eating sugar a while ago and it's amazing. I don't even crave it. And I definitely used to, I used to, I always thought I had a sweet tooth. Like this is me, you know, I don't like salt. I don't like fat, but ch chocolate. Oh my God, I'm a chocolate-holic. I have to have it every day. Well, for some reason I stopped having it. I don't, like, I don't even crave it. I don't even, it's like, I forgot what it tastes like. It, it's amazing. Um, I never thought that would happen to me. Anyway, he's just saying that even something as basic as eating has been completely socially restructured and corrupted. So the whole process of getting hungry and eating, everything is corrupt. Amazing. Um, anyway, so that's that one. And then this one is what universities owe democracies. And I do think it's really important um, he's speaking from the point of view of a big public university. And of course, I've always had the point of view of a small liberal arts educator, but as the other article, Virtue of an Educated Citizen, that's kind of where I plug in because I've understood that intuitively. I attended two small liberal arts colleges as an undergrad, and I actually, my grad school was at a liberal arts college, which hardly ever happens. And then all my career was at, um, how many, three different liberal arts colleges. And so I do have a sense of the climate on a campus, trying to create this, a climate where students learn leadership abilities. That's why the article on management, is trying to help you become uh, a citizen, you learn about citizenship. The fraternities, the Greek system, it's called Greek, is that students would 
create their own organizations and they take turns ruling and being ruled. So they're setting up their little mini democracy and the culture is supposed to be, we have students more oriented toward helping future leaders take leadership positions. So we have students on search committees. We have students on a whole lot of um, faculty and staff committees, which I think is really good. Um, all right, so um, yeah, um, the difference between a liberal arts educator, education means to educe, to draw out from students what is inside of them, and so that they come to know themselves and they can figure out what they actually think and talk to other people about that, be accountable, transparent. Um, but that's very different than being a professor. Professors profess things, right? They tell you what they know that nobody else knows. And um, when I try to publish in journals, I have to be a professor and talk to other professors. And I really don't like it. <laughs> I really don't like it, but I've done it. Um, and most of the time I just tell them, I disagree with all you clones. So get over it, get over yourselves. But I don't say it in that many words. Um, uh, I'm a little bit more sociable, shall we say? Okay, well, I will see you soon and take care.